Okay, so the biggest game right now, and it, it's probably a shoe-in for a game of the year, is Bioshock Infinite. Uh, the hype for this one was undoubtedly going to be huge. Everyone was excited to see it, you know, at E3, all the conventions I went to. Because the Bioshock series has consistently been really good, or at least really good in the views of a lot of the fans. You know, uh, it's, it's just really well put together. The plots have pretty much always been the best part of it. Very well written series. Now, <laughs> here's where I come into it. I have never liked the Bioshock series. Now, it's it's kind of a mixed praise when it comes to this, where I, it, I, I, I admire it for what it's done, but it never really clicked for me, and I know I've already lost 90% of you. But um, I'll try to explain, and this isn't fair, what I'm about to say. It's no System Shock 2. None of them have been. I'm one of those old-school PC gamers who System Shock 2 is probably one of the top five of my favorite games of all time. And Bioshock is the spiritual successor to... Uh, System Shock is the spiritual successor to Bioshock. It's kind of modeled after the same thing, kind of. But it's that type of thing. It even borrows some of its name from System Shock. Um, the fact that people kind of hold it up there, it just doesn't hold water for me. And I, I think a lot of the reason for that is the gameplay. Um, the, the plot is very good. Uh, and even some of the even some of the uh, harder to police fans out there will say that's not very good. But I thought the whole Andrew Ryan thing was was actually very excellent. No, I don't think anybody saw that coming. Um, and I'm not going to spoil that for you. If you haven't played it, you should. Even if you don't like it, it's one of those games that you should. And even Bioshock Infinite, I would definitely recommend love it or hate it. I, I would recommend you play it, and no matter what I say. However, if you're watching this, you should. Uh, you better have finished it, because I will warn you right now, this entire thing is going to be huge, epic, balls-deep spoilers. So if you haven't played it, and you want to play it, shut this video off and go play it. Um, that said, if you can rent it, I would rent it. Uh, it. It really is one of those games that is only worthy of, of one playthrough. And again, here's why I'll lose you. I really I, This game has no replay value. It, it just doesn't. And what's funny is a lot of my complaints are somewhat answered in the 1999 mode, which is the hardest mode there is. Um, one of my complaints to come up with is this, there's essentially no consequence for dying, which has always been a problem in Bioshock. I've always felt that it's been on easy mode. You know, it's, it's almost impossible to lose the Bioshock games. Because you can die, and there's almost no hesitation in you resurrect instantly, and you, you just leap out of a Vita chamber, and you're ready to go again. You know, there's, there's basically no penalty. You lose a few bucks. <laughs> no, tops. It's only in 1999 mode that you're shown any kind of lasting harm from from death. Uh, Bioshock, I, I, it really frustrated me, Bioshock, because it wasn't even a second later after dying that you popped right out of a Vita chamber to get ready to fight again. And it, it almost, it, it wasn't fair to the bad guys. I, I felt bad for them because you, you, you could be fighting a, a big daddy and it would kill you. You'd pop right out of a Vita chamber and it would still have all the damage. So even through a war of attrition, you could keep banging on it with a wrench. You had no ammo. Just keep banging it with a wrench. Pop out, pop out. You know, and you, you feel so bad for the big daddy. It was like, I, I, what I had to do was I actually had to handicap myself to make that game playable. What I would do is I would set, like, checkpoints for myself at the beginning of every stage and kind of at the halfway point to where if I died, I would set myself back to that checkpoint. And I shouldn't have to do that. Um, I think there were mods later on that actually installed quick saves. And that's, this is what I'm talking so, so you might say, like, well, you could say quick saves are the same thing. They are, but... There's uh, there's still a time penalty, you know what I mean? You still lose time. You know, every game you come back, but there's checkpoints. It'll set you back a certain amount. Um, so a lot of people complain that checkpoints are too few or too too many. Um, this was one where they're basically, it's not too many, there are no checkpoints. Your checkpoint is 
the Vita Chamber, and that's usually, you almost can't go like 30 yards without hitting a Vita Chamber, and it also raises some plot holes, like how do people die in Bioshock when there's a Vita Chamber that will instantly clone you whenever your vital signs drop? So, that was actually kind of a, my main complaint against Bioshock, uh, the Bioshock series. But, moving on to Bioshock Infinite, there's kind of... There, there's kind of two things to analyze about this game. And right away I know I'm opening myself up for a lot of punishments online. I don't expect everyone, I don't expect hardly anyone to agree with me, because this really is one of the best received, highly rated games of the year. I, I really think uh, there's going to be a short list of games of the year, and this is really going to be hard to beat on the list. And I can see why. It really is. It really is well written to a point, but it's if you're kind of. I think this does kind of go into. It really shows a generational gap between old school gamers like myself and the new school. You know, uh, if you've never played a game like this before that had a serious plot, and I'm I'm coming off as snobbish. I have seen this kind of game before. And if you're in the younger generation who kind of grew up with this generation of consoles, like 360 and onward, I know you haven't. So, that's not to say the older games were better or worse, although they were better. <laughs> no. Um, it's I, I, I can definitely see the appeal here. It's just that I've seen games that do this and do it better, or at least, in my opinion, do it better. Um, System Shock 2 being one of them. Now, System Shock 2 didn't have like this kind of twist, but it, it does have... It is... It's fine. I, I guess my problem with the plot comes from the fact that I disagree with the plot so much. It actually kind of borderline offends me, the way this this uh, plot ends. So when I say there's, there's two ways to analyze this game, there's the gameplay itself and the plot. I wanted to start with the gameplay, which is very oddly being roundly praised. I, I think if anything is kind of objectively bad about this game, it's the gameplay. Now, I'm not saying it's it's bad. I'm saying it's just not nearly as good as people say. This really is, to me, one of the more overrated games, especially... <clears throat> excuse me. Especially in terms of gameplay. I just... It, this is another thing that never really clicked with me. So, I, I've actually made a list because there was a lot of... There's a lot of things, so you'll excuse me if I, I look at this thing. Um... <clears throat> I just kind of said it was average. When you hold it up to other shooters, I just found that so much of it falls short of what other shooters have done. I, I found the melee combat to be really kind of chaotic and uninspired. Now, you could easily argue melee combat is chaotic and uninspired, but it just felt like trading shots like Rock'em Sock'em Robots with this hook, and it, it it felt really strange to me that you had this really, really powerful thing, but I just had to keep pounding on people over and over and over and over and over again. Like, their little health bar would decrease so slowly that it really got frustrating, and, and melee combat became this uh, basically not an option for the most part. It, it kind of became a, a death blow finishing maneuver. And knowing that, it was a lot more satisfying, but you couldn't just go in like Call of Duty and, you know, just, like, rifle butt somebody and they would go down instantly. You know, it's up to you whether or not you... It really did kind of deviate from status quo and made the game a little bit frustrating until you kind of realized that you you had to basic... It was mainly for fatalities, you know, this whole idea of of the, the melee combat. You know, you had, to, you had to kind of figure out you had to rely on, on guns. And so I, I think I kind of felt misled at first where... You've got this thing, the first time you see this claw being used is that you just completely maim a motherfucker. Like, you just you just rip his head off, and then when that doesn't happen every time you use this thing, I'm like, what the fuck am I doing wrong? I don't know. Um, uh, then there's the powers. For, I just found that the powers in uh, the, the other Bioshocks were way more satisfying, the plasmids, and I don't... It, it's hard to explain why, because there actually were a lot more options when it came to the plasmids, or when it came to the vigors in this one. Like, there was always this option to lay traps with all the plasmids, and there was a lot more variety 
I think, to the to the Vigors. So I was I was actually kind of curious as to why I didn't like them as much, and I, I kind of figured out why. Um, for I I just found that in this game I tended to latch on to two powers, which was convenient because the the quick the the quick exchange of the vigors was between two of them. And so I almost always found myself just swapping between the two, and every time I got a new Vigor, I'd play with it a little bit, and then I just got bored. You know, I just, you know, Bucking Bronco, which does have its uses. I think it is really one, one of the more broken ones, but when I got Bucking Bronco, I was just like, eh, no, not really. I throw somebody up in the air, so what? And actually, when I started playing with it for real, it was, it was pretty good. But I, I kind of had fallen, uh, when, I, when I got Murder of Crows... And I think anyone who got this one, and I didn't know this was probably one of the most OP, you know, uh, vigors in the game. I just, I, I, when I saw it, I was like, oh, it, it basically immobilizes them and opens them up to, it makes them much more vulnerable to damage. And I was like, wow, that's cool. Especially since it affected so many other targets, I could lay it as traps and it would, you know, I really love that plasmid and everyone else liked it too because it's really overpowered. So what I do is I just throw Murder of Crows and just go Carbine on them and it, it was it was perfect for me, you know. Um, and Bucking Bronco is, is almost exactly the same thing, except it didn't really do damage. It would it would hold them up in the air and I could shoot them, you know, whatever. But I was really just doing, like, Murder of Crows and the 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 friendly fire one where you would you would persuade them because I would use that on the more powerful ones. I would hijack the mobilized patriots or mechanized patriots and stuff like that. Um, I, I just really used two... And the other ones just kind of fell by the wayside. I never liked the lightning one. I never really liked the fire one. If I was going to follow up anything from Murder of Crows, it was the fire one. But, yeah, th it was just like I would get these powers and, eh. You know, I, I didn't like having to go through... It was so... This is silly, but I didn't like spending the three seconds it took to kind of go through the radial menu and select the different ones. I just kind of quick swap between the two. And money is relatively tight in this game. So you it's one of those games where you've kind of got to pick, you know, when it comes to the guns and when it comes to the when it comes to the vigors, you you kind of had to you needed to choose. You know, you needed to choose two or three guns and two or three uh vigors and just kind of pray you hope you picked right. It's one of those games where you can upgrade everything, but you got to pick. You know, you're going to you're going to level you you don't want to level up every one of them a little bit. You need to max out just a few. So that was I, I think that was the problem with the vigors, and maybe not a problem per se, but some of the vigors come so late, you like you know, you get you get um uh, I can't remember which come which ones come later and which you know. But when you get one of the last ones, you've you've committed yourself already and you're not gonna level up the other ones, you know, why would you? You don't even if it's really good, you're like, well, I've I've gone too deep into the other ones. I, I don't know. So, and for some reason, I was just really unimpressed. Maybe it was the sound design, or maybe it was the... Well, I do know one reason why. It was just like, for some reason, the plasmids, to me, lacked a lot of punch. You know, when I was playing the original Bioshock, and you, you cut loose with the lightning thing, it looked like the lightning fucking hurt, and there was like this huge thunderclap that that existed through there and it just felt like there was this is what this is what I did like over BioShock is it felt like there was a lot more opportunity to use those you know vigors in a really creative way um for instance there's a lot of standing water in BioShock and if you use the lightning in the water it would hit everything in that puddle of water and so you felt like you were really clever when you were kind of luring them into the water and hitting them, and so there was a, there was a lot of moments like that where you could set traps near explosive, you know, tanks and stuff like that, and it felt really cool. And I know there were I, I know there were uh, spots like that in Bioshock Infinite, like like pools of like gasoline or fuel, but it always like, like I never saw them when the fight started. Um, it was it was actually very subtle for me. I I and maybe I maybe it was just me, but I never saw them. I never saw the the pools of fuel, um, and they weren't big enough to where I felt like I could lure them in there. It was always like I would kill everyone on the immediate area, and then I would be walking around going like, "Oh, there was a oh there was a gas tank there. I didn't see that. Man, I, if I'd have known that, I might have tried to use it or something like that." And 
And even if even if I did think I was going to use it, I didn't have the fire thing equipped anyway, you know. So it was it was like I would if even if I was trying to set it up, I was opening myself up for a lot more damage. You know, I I just that's that's what it felt like to me. I just felt like I had a lot less a lot less reason and a lot less inclination to use the vigors when the guns were kind of my, you know, Murder of Crows and guns were like my catch-all. I never had a problem with that. I never had a reason really to set them on fire in the, like, okay, here's the the fire thing worked well enough on its own. You could catch people in the fire. It almost felt like I didn't have a I didn't need to, you know, trap them in the fuel. If I leveled up the fire thing enough, I could throw a fireball big enough that it would catch everyone in the immediate area on fire anyway. So, there's, there was kind of like no point to being clever, and even if you wanted to be clever in the use of your plasmids, the traps were good enough. Because every single power had that thing where you could lay a trap and it would work anyway. So if you wanted to lure them in, or catch them when they were rushing onto the map, that's all you needed to do. So, and, and as I recall in Bioshock, you could only lay traps with a, with a very few of them. In fact, that was one of the reasons to use the crossbow was that it was one of the few weapons where you could lay traps, you could lay tripwires, you know, across the hallways, and that's how you took down the big daddies. So that that was what I liked. Um, also, I was really cynical about the the fact that it, it kind of went, it, it, it did go Halo in the use of the recharging shield and the fact that you could only carry two weapons. I was just like, oh, they went Halo. Which really went against what, uh, which really went against what Bioshock used to do. I mean, you always can run into that unrealism thing where, you know, for some reason you can carry every single weapon known to man, like Duke Nukem, which is the way Bioshock handled it. And then all of a sudden we go to Bioshock Infinite. And now you can only carry two, which was a bummer because you were collecting ammo for every single weapon, but you were still kind of only committing to two, because you were only going to upgrade those two. And for some reason, it seemed to me like there was five different varieties of submachine guns that I could not tell the difference between them. You know what I mean? There was the there was the burst fire thing, and then there was the normal machine gun, and then there was like three other ones, like the, the, uh, the Vox Populi machine gun, and then the, the, the normal group's machine gun, and I was like, what? there's one that's red. That's the only thing I could tell the difference between. And I hadn't really committed to those anyway. I was focused on the carbine, the carbine, and the, uh... uh who, who maxed out the pistol, really? I was like, you got so many guns and you're going to max out the pistol. It was the shotgun. I maxed out the shotgun. Um, because that was the that was the close range thing. I was going carbine for the, for the short range, for the long range, and the shotgun for short range. Um, beyond that, I didn't care a fuck about the pistol. Um, the hand cannon was... The hand cannon was like, if you didn't max out the shotgun, the hand cannon was what you did before. I'm not... Actually, if I'd have known I was gonna hack... Uh, I probably would have maxed out the hand cannon, because the faster rate of fire and the more... The bigger clip size. But yeah, um, the recharging shield was like straight out of Halo. In fact, I expected the Lucet twins, when they handed you the shield, vigor to be like, you've seen Halo, right? Works just like that. Um... The AI in this game is terrible. I, I found it really, really bad because there's there's almost like a majority a majority of characters that are psychotic. Like they are they are dedicated melee combatants who just like take a billy club and they just charge you and damn the consequences. Like you've got this guy who's hurling fireballs and is, who 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 has an RPG on his shoulder and is just cutting loose. And there's this motherfucker with a billy club who's like. This guy's mine. Ah! And comes at you. Like, and I've seen, like, I, I've seen a couple guys, like, do the Han Solo charge thing where they see you pointing at them and they're like, oh shit! And then they run away. But it was only a few times. I was like, these guys, they come charge around the fucking corner. Doesn't matter how many b bodies are, like, piled up right around the corner. They're like, he must be out of ammo by now! Ah! And just come charging at you. I'm like, what the fuck is with these guys? You know, we've, we've come, this is 2013. We've got. Decades and decades of, of game design, and we've still got this problem of guys charging around the corner into certain death. They have to literally wade over the piles of their co the, the dead bodies of their comrades to get to you. They're like, I'm going to be the one. You're mine. And, and just do this. I, I thought it was so silly. Um, 
thinking about it, th I, I wrote this complaint, and thinking about it, this is not necessarily as big a problem as I thought it was. I, I really don't, I, I didn't remember at the time there was that much variety in enemies. And there are more than I remembered, because the I, I'd forgotten about the crows and the... By the way, crows and ravens are not the same thing. Um, I just didn't remember that many different types of, of enemies. At least none of them really stuck with me. Um, all I really remembered was kind of generic guys with guns and generic guys with billy clubs. Later on, there were a lot of the mechanized patriots and, and stuff like that. But I really... You know, the crows were not that common... The, you know, and the fire guy's not that common. The only other enemy that I really remembered that really pissed me off were the guys with the, uh, the volley guns that just kind of fired grenades. Those guys were really fucking annoying, but those are the only things I really remembered. Snipers. Snipers were more of, like, an annoyance, though, than anything. They didn't really stick out in my mind. Um, the guns were really boring to me. It was, it was kind of the same... The same old, same old collection of weapons, pistol, shotgun, sniper rifle, ineffectual submachine gun. You know, I just, I was not impressed with that. Death still has really no consequence. It wasn't quite as cheese as the, as the, uh, Vita Chamber, but it was almost, it, it was almost as silly, where you died and then you just, like, stepped out of the dream office and then you were right back there. Um, or for s somehow, and I don't know how, Elizabeth dragged your big ass to around a corner. No matter how many guys were around you, there could be mechanized patriots literally stomping your face. But somehow Elizabeth would drag you down there, jam you with a syringe. I don't know where the fuck she got it, and you're back on your feet. Those gunshot wounds are healed up. I don't know, I just, it felt cheese. Um, and it, now here's the thing, I know that it was, I know that it's intrinsic to the plot. I get that. The reason that happens in the plot is because the Lutesses um, are going back in time and getting a parallel version of you, and every time you die, that character, it, whenever you're in the office anyway, when you step out of the dream office and go there, that's a different version of Booker that the Lutesses recruited and brought you to the same place, and you stepped out. So if you didn't quite get that from the plot... It's, every time you die, it's a different version of Booker that's been led to the exact same spot, only this one made a different decision and you didn't die. You follow? That's why early in the game when you step through that door and the guy's got like a sandwich board that has all the coin flips written down, that's how many Bookers up to that point have come through that door and guessed the coin flip. So I, I thought that was really cool. Um, so, in, in it's, it's when you, at, by the ending, that a lot of those things, like, Sixth Sense, like, really came through. And that's, that's something I really did like. So, that's why that happens. I just still thought there was really not much of a consequence. It was more clever, plot-wise, than it was in terms of gameplay. And actually, I thought they should have stuck with that instead of having Elizabeth drag you off and jam you with the magic syringe of health. I just, yeah... And, let me see, um, the Sky Rail. Everyone thinks the Sky Rail is so awesome. And I grant you that it's a clever mechanic. It's, it's actually very exciting, very fast, very... It, it's fun. However, in terms of the setting, and in terms of the game I think they were trying to put forward, it's completely out of place to me. And this... Hey, face front, would you? Well, I know, but face you're gonna be like that are you burton is being a pest right now um i just found it out of place there was a lot about this setting that i think really contrasted with the type of game they wanted to put forward and this is where a lot of my complaints kind of come to a head with what a fan is likely to say and i'll get to that in a second but to me the sky rail didn't make sense because <clears throat> because who could possibly use this thing you know, and if, if this were real, and, uh, like, let's give this credit and say this is something that were real. Who could possibly use this thing? All of a sudden, Booker is jumping like Spider-Man and hooking onto this thing with this buzzsaw hook thing. And so, now you've entered this realm of reality, which you might as well just throw it out the window. Where, like, you go, anything is possible. Booker is essentially a superhero. Everyone who can possibly use this thing 
is a superhero. And you go, well, they, they, you know, he has vigors and plasmids. They kind of are. No, not really. For a few reasons. One, it, the, what's what's funny to me partially is that you've you've got this you you've got this setting where vigors are something that is real. They exist. They they modify your body to give you like telekinetic powers. You can throw fire. You can you can hack machines. Okay, so you've got these things. Why is Booker like the only guy in Colombia who actually has them? There's a few guys, a few, who can like turn into crows or, you know, can throw fire. But that's it. You know, it's like it's like two percent of the of the fighting force actually has these. And I've heard somebody say that, well, it makes them mutated and psychotic, which is why the crows are are freakish and psychotic. Well, Okay, but, like, I, I just don't understand why... I, I don't get it. Like, you've got this thing that's established, something that is common, and yet, like, there's somebody... There's this chick who's standing at a, at a fair just handing them out for free. Why? So you've got to assume there's vending machines that sell these things. You know, and I, I, I'm like, why, if they're so dangerous, are people selling them? They make you psychotic. Why are they selling them? You would think if Comstock was so paranoid about stopping you, he'd start handing these things out like they were candy. He's like, this guy's got to be stopped. You need to be powered because he's got like every power in the world. Drink this shit. You got to stop him. I'll pay you double or something like that. So, but you don't see any of these guys really use these vigors. It's like, why are you the the superhuman? Like, how are you the, you're the only guy that throws lightning and it seems silly to me, which ties into the fact that you've got all these vending machines set up around Colombia that sell this shit. Like, why would you need, if you lived in Colombia, if this were real, and even if it's not real, why would this exist? Why do vending machines sell guns and ammo? Vending machines! In, in the, can you imagine walking around here? And I know this is meant to be like an exaggerated version of the United States, but like, oh, like a, a, you see a vending machine that is like, do you want a shotgun? Come on! And like, you start stuffing hundred dollar bills in there, and it spits out a fucking shotgun. You need ammo, twenty dollars, and like, you know, that's so weird. Like, and there's no, there's no vending machines for like for for fucking Snickers bars or Cheetos or Funyuns. No, we've got vending machines everywhere that sell fucking plasmid upgrades and shotgun ammo. Yeah, cuz that makes sense. We have so much more of a market for those than fucking Mountain Dew. You know, it, it I just found it so silly. It it really clashes with with any kind of reality. You know what I mean? So, and then, okay, but you're like, well, maybe they do sell Mountain Dew, but it's completely irrelevant to the plot. No, because food is such an intrinsic part of the, of the game. You'd think maybe it would spit out stuff, but yeah, I, I, the vending machines were like one of those things where I was like, I, I, I had to nitpick on that because it made, because you got to figure Comstock was setting up this, this world, this world that floats on quantum physics and balloons, and he's he's planning things out. He's like, yes, I want a gift shop over here, and what's he doing? No, coat machine? Fuck that! No, I need a sh I need a gun machine. <laughs> like, and no, no, gun machine there too. We don't have enough gun machines. <laughs> Like, people need guns, goddammit. This is America. We ought to have guns being spit out of fucking machines that look like Uncle Sam. America! It, it was so ridiculous to me. So, it, this is where I'm coming down on this, where, like, you have these... You have a lot of complaints when it comes to realism that are diffused when people kind of fall back on the excuse, well, it's a game. What do you want? A lot of games do that. Yeah, but... This is, we're talking about a game that is, that is actually trying to take itself a little bit seriously. You've got this thing where, even though you've got, like, these mutant powers, it still kind of is grounded in the basis of science, if you follow me. You're, we are actually kind of dealing with a real-life scenario. We're just kind of dealing with kind of a far-fetched historical you know, like, what if history kind of went this way? What if we actually had a guy through steampunk version of, version of, like, science 
built this underwater city? Or what if we had a guy through steampunk science built this floating city that works on balloons? So it, it kind of, it is sci-fi, it is gamey in that you have these magic powers, but we still don't have this kind of reality where all of a sudden we've got people leaping 30 feet in the air and flying on hooks like, you know, like, like Spider-Man only with, you know, hooks. Um, so it, it actually did kind of take that, that suspension of disbelief level and really kick the bar up to, I thought, a kind of unrealistic, very un-Bioshock level to where you, you, you went this far and then all of a sudden it, it had you accept this thing. So I was, I, I started like, every time I was watching this, I was going, if this were real and you had these skyhook systems, who would possibly use them? Who would be insane enough to like strap a hook on their arm and start riding on this sky rail at fucking Mach 3? I was like, and, and then there's, like, a major part of this is you did this, like, death from above attack where you, like, missile drop kick a bitch, you know, from the sky hook. And I was like, th th even, in, even in, like, comic book reality, this wouldn't be happening because it's, it's just ridiculous. You're going so fast. And th this is the other thing. You, fa you take falling damage in this game unless... You were riding the sky rail and you jump off it onto somebody. So like you could be if 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 there was like a sixty foot drop, I was stunned by this. I died because of this. I jumped off. I walked off a a, a platform, fell like forty fifty feet, and I died. And I was like, what, what the fuck is that? I've fallen like three times as high, but I was doing the the dismount from the sky hook. I was fine. I was like, what? That you can't even be consistent in that in that world and then and so you know maybe i get they were trying to be a little bit forgiving in the sense that you know you want to have that kind of leeway when you're doing the death from above attack however it still seems really inconsistent to me because of how ludicrously fast you are going when you are leaping off this sky hook um so I, I, I just kept going like, you know, if this were real, who would be stupid? Because you fuck up. You jump 30 feet in the air, maybe you get distracted, or maybe, like, your your trick knee gives out, and you don't quite jump as high. You're dead. You fall off fucking Columbia, and you drop, like, eight miles into the into the fucking ocean, and you're dead. You know, how does, how is that how people get to work? Is, like, because I don't, I don't remember really, really seeing any, like, gondolas or, like, fairies or something like that. No. Like, how, what if, like, mom has to go to work? Does mom, like, strap on the hook and, like, ride down there and go speed? Ah! You know? Um, and then, then, like, jump off, like, at 60 feet in the air? Like, what if she accidentally lands on somebody and their head explodes? Or, like, you know... If, if this were any kind of even a remotely real situation, like even in comic books, this wouldn't happen. Let's, you know, J. Jonah Jameson, he leaps in the air and he's like, ah, and he's like, ah, oh, there's the, there's the Daily Planet, and, <laughs> not Daily Planet, you know, Daily, the, the Bugle. And he jumps off and, you know, he hits the ground at like fucking 80 miles an hour. His knees would explode like popcorn. He would be crippled instantly. You know, this, not, and, and this is, again, we're talking with a reality where not everyone takes plasmids. So if you're arguing that not t not everyone takes them, or not even the majority of people take them, okay, well, why are they able to ride on fucking sky rails and not fucking have their knees punching out through their collarbone? Um, it's nitpicks like that, that that really seemed unnecessary when it comes to the context of the story. Um, let, me, let me see. Uh, one of the other things that I found really, really hilarious that is that this is like a very much looters type of game you know you spend so much of the game scouring every inch of the setting for money because you have to you know so you know i spent about the first hour of the game just stealing shit it, like so i was picturing this reality let's say you were an outsider you see this guy you've never seen before he's dressed strangely He's carrying a gun in public. Because you remember that part where, like, you go to the gift shop and you're carrying a gun. Nobody else is carrying a gun. So you're like a guy who's a civilian carrying a gun into a gift shop. Like, even today, like, in Arizona, you can openly carry a gun. You really can. 
Now, you can't necessarily take it into a to a actually you can't. You can't take it into a, a public area. You you can't take it indoors, basically, except for a very few places. Actually there's a law that's kind of being considered. I'm actually not sure what the status is of people being able to carry guns in bars because that seems like a good idea now you've got drunk people with guns that's awesome isn't it anyway but yeah you've got booker who's carrying a fucking gun in a toy store and nobody nobody even blinks at this they're like welcome would you like to buy a cthulhu doll and you're like yes i would um and i was like well now we're talking about a reality where they're fucking gun vending machines right next to the fucking gift shop so would it really be that weird and i'm like but nobody else is carrying a fucking gun like nobody except the police i'm like who's buying these fucking guns and if so why is nobody else armed except for the because honestly that would be kind of awesome is if you started shit in town and like every single civilian like whipped out a fucking machine gun or like ran that would be hilarious is if if you started firing and then all the civilians like ran to the gun vending machines and started pulling out fucking rifles that would be so kick ass and so that would actually be awesome we need to mod that where they start like if they get to the vending machine they start ripping down shotguns and plasmids and they start fighting back because these guys they're Americans they don't take no shit um, yeah and I've actually got another story about that which I'll which I'll get to is uh, where was I? Uh, walking around with a gun, walking into a gift shop. Yeah, um, the looting. So, let's say you're an outsider. You live in Colombia, and there's this weird guy dressed weird. He's carrying a gun, and you just, you're just watching him. And he's running around, and he starts looting everything. <laughs> Like, he's going around, he's looking under park benches, and he's grabbing shit off the park... He's like, there's a purse on a park bench, and he starts looking through it, and there's a wallet under the, um, like, near a potted plant, and he's, he's like, mm, and he's takes, taking the money out of there, throwing the shit down. Um, he's, and every single garbage can you come across, he rips open the lid of the garbage can, and he starts looking through the garbage, and he, like, there's a crate, and he rips open the crate that's near, like, a, a store. He rips it open, he starts sifting through there, and he's taking shit out, and he's stuffing it in his pants, and... So, imagine, it's like, you're imagining this guy, he's opening the garbage can and he finds a fucking slice of cake. Because this happens. You find this fucking chocolate cake in a trash can, and what does he do? He immediately rams the fucker right in his mouth. I found a hot dog in a garbage can one time, and I was like, Ow. Oh my god. It makes me sick just thinking about it. And so, like, you're like, I need health. Ow. And you're watching this guy. You know, it, like... I haven't even seen, like, really homeless people do that. Like, you know, maybe if it was, like, wrapped up and sealed or something like that. But I've never seen a motherfucker, like, take a hot dog out of a trash can. Oh, oh that's good. Like, you should at least, like, if you found food in the garbage can, it should be spoiled and bad for you. You know? Because you see spoiled food in the game. Like, you, like, a couple times I saw, like, rotten fruit that if you eat it, it causes damage. So, like, you should find bad food in the trash can, not a fucking chocolate cake that you, you shove into your fucking mouth. Uh, I always found it funny that... Eat, and I know this happens in every game ever, but I always found, especially in this game, I found it funny, like, if you got, you've been shot up, you got bullet wounds, you've been set on fire, and you're hiding behind a counter, and you're like, Dude! There's a chocolate cake here. Ah, and you eat it, and you're like, I feel so much better. My bullet wounds are healed. I don't know. They, 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 if, if you're talking about plasmids, they actually might have done better to, like, do pull a Mr. Fusion type of idea where, like, yeah, the plasmids, the, the vigors inside you will heal damage if as long as you kind of feed it organic matter or, like, food. It'll accelerate the healing process. That would have actually been kind of cool to explain that. But yeah, I, I, was, I found it so funny, this concept of looting and finding so much food just laying around that you just, you jam it in your mouth. Like, Booker must be the biggest competitive eater ever. I You eat so much fucking food in the course of a day. Just, ah, I, I've just rammed, uh, like, entire fucking pineapples. You'll kill guys. You'll kill guys and start, like, rifling their pockets, and you'll pull out a fucking pineapple. Where did he keep this thing up his ass? Like... Why would you're working with somebody in the police and you see it like, hey, Ron, is that a pineapple in your pants? You're just happy to see me. It's a pineapple. 
<laughs> why did you carry a pineapple? And like, why did you carry the, like, maybe, okay, that's your lunch. Okay, you brought a pineapple for lunch. Weird, but okay. But then all of a sudden you heard gunfire. And they're like, it's that guy who caused that massacre. Let's get him. Hang on, I'm going to get my pineapple. Ah, you know, like, why do you bring the pineapple? You don't need to do this. You could, like, you could replace the entire concept of food. This isn't complicated. Just say, like, you find a Band-Aid. Like, if you want to have something that restores just a little bit of health, say, like, you find a bottle of Tylenol, or you find a Band-Aid, or something like that, it doesn't make much more sense, but it makes a little more sense than a guy carrying out a fucking pineapple. I just... It was so silly. So, um... You know, l let me see. The, uh... That might be about it when it came to the gameplay. I just found it average. You know, I just... Especially, it, I don't think it even held up to the other Bioshock games, the, the, the notion of this. So, I saw a lot, I saw so many people praising the gameplay like it was like some kind of revolutionary. And I'm not saying it's bad, it's not. It's just not that great. And that's, this is where I'm coming down on the game in general. Like, you know, I don't, it, it's fine if you like it. I can definitely see why you, what are you looking at? Burton, you are really in a mood today. I think Burton is so tired. Ah, fuck. This is ruining my review, Burton. I'm sorry, everyone. He is being unruly. I think I need to replace his load pan. Anyway, um, yeah, I just, I just, I, I can see why you like it, and it's not bad. I don't care if you like it. I can see why you do. There's nothing, like, objectively really wrong with it. I just, I, I don't see people praising it to the moon. I, I just, I just don't get that. So, if you think I'm coming down super hard on this and saying it's horrible, no. You, you can tell I'm not really angry about it. There's just so many things that I find funny that, that really hold this game back. I think it could have been so much better. Also, the field of vision, I don't know if you can change this in the console version. I know you can change it in the PC version. But your field of vision is so fucking narrow. When I get into melee combat, forget it. Forget it, man. I can't do shit. Um, it, it just, it felt really claustrophobic to me. Personal preference, I get that. But for me on the console version, also, maybe it's different on the PC. Uh, texture pop-in was bad. It was really bad. Um, also, like, uh, this happened, I think, in a few games, uh, but it might have actually happened by the original Bioshock, but I found, like, almost so many enemies were, like, identical clones. It really felt like I was fighting the same guys over and over. There was, it seemed like there were four or five guys. When you go into the arcade, th there's an arcade you go into, and it's populated by, like, the same four arcade games. Like, the entire place, three floors of this fucking place same three or four arcade games. I was like, this is so lazy. There's no kind of skee-ball or something. It's, a, it's, a, it's not even games, really. It's just some kind of, like, shitty Punch and Judy thing. And I know it's steampunky. I know the technology isn't, like... There's no, like... There's no video games, per se. But, like, you could still have kind of mechanical type of games, like pinball, skee-ball, something like that. I don't know. It just seemed like these arcades were really, like, really crap. I would never go to this arcade. How is there an ocean in Colombia? You go to this place where there's a fucking beach, and like, well, th th there's a whole, there's an ocean there, and I'm like, oh, it's artificial, but still, how the fuck? And I, I guess you have to wave your hand and go, quantum physics, the Lutesses did it with the parallel shit. I don't know. Um, this leads me. Oh, um, Elizabeth. Again, nitpicky. And I'm not sure how to solve this, because the, the alternative is worse. But Elizabeth seemed such... She's, she's really useful, in that I've never seen an AI companion be so useful. That stays out of your way, and in fact, like, tosses you ammo. That's so cool, that you're like, you're running out of ammo, and she's like, GUN! And she throws you a gun, and you're like, FUCK YEAH! And you start to... So, like, I thought that was really awesome. However... It, it really, it kind of took me out of it by the fact that she is so invincible. She's like running around like she doesn't even care. There's open gunfights going around and she's just, ah, she's, and I've seen her get shot. In fact, I laughed my ass off. There's one scene where I was coming out of a building and 
there's all sorts of badness coming around. There's like two mechanized patriots, and th- like there's there's everything is coming around there. There's guys with fucking rocket launchers. So I turn around and I go. Um, I, I go back to where I was, and Elizabeth is right behind me, but there's like two snipers. And so I'm standing around, like, waiting for them to come around or, like, trying to get a clear shot. And I see her coming around to try to get back in the same building I'm in. And, like, no joke, like, five bullets smack directly into her back. Like, you can see the, you, you can see them hit. She's like, thap, 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 thap. And she, does she flinch? No, she should be fucking dead. But I, I'm just watching her like, oh, shit, that had to hurt. That have fucking killed me. Now, I know. I know she's she's kind of meant to be she's kind of meant to be abstracted. She's not meant to die. Um, she's just kind of meant to be she's kind of meant to be inconsequential in combat because you're not supposed to worry about her. In fact, the game says she can take care of herself. Well, she didn't fucking take care of herself then. She really instead of running around, she should just hide. And like maybe there should be like on every map some kind of like little crate she could hide behind or in so she kind of vanishes from sight every once in a while you could do something where like if you're running out of ammo she kind of spawns behind you and throws you shit and then she kind of vanishes it seemed it, it was little things like that that i just found funny um also there was there seemed like maybe i missed a lot of locked things but i had way more lock picks than there were excuses to use them by the end of the game i had like 20 spare lock picks Maybe it's more, maybe it's a lot rarer in the 99 mode. I don't know. I didn't play mo- much of it. Um, I, I did find it the best way to play it. However, you have to beat the game once to play 99 mode. And so I would suggest if you're any kind of, it, it's hard, but if I, you should play it in 1999 mode if you want any kind of challenge. However, you have to beat it once to get there. And so I was like, I just don't see myself playing the plot after, you know, seeing, because there's a lot of slowness in the game, and that's not to its detriment, actually, I'll get to that, but I just don't see myself watching that story again, unless I really want to experience it all over again, just to see all the clues kind of pay off, and maybe it's worth it, maybe, I don't know, for me, it just didn't, it's not worth it to me, um, the only reason would be, like, Chivo whoring, and I don't do that, uh, so this leads me to the plot, which actually, this is going to be where I'm a lot more controversial. The twist is awesome. However, where I come down on this is that I think a lot of people walked out of this, or walked out, I think a lot of people came away from this game with a very different message than I did. Maybe, I, I definitely overthink this type of thing, but I'm actually curious as to whether the writers themselves knew what they were saying by the end of this game. Okay, so, again, total, complete spoilers. Do not blame me. Okay, so basically the entire premise of this game is that you find out later is that um, hypertime exists. This is, this is exactly what hypertime is, where there's an infinite number of dimensions Actually, there's infinite on infinite number of dimensions. There's bigger than infinite, if that's possible, but it's sci-fi, you know. Try to wrap your head around that. Um, So, every time there's a decision to be made, it has been made, but every decision branches off into two, to where one dimension is where you took one way, another dimension is where you took another. So, right now, there is a dimension where I, I take off my pants and I run around screaming haikus so there's one dimension where i just did that and another dimension where i just kept going and there's i i could have done anything i i could i could replace this with i could put oreo in the chair and just walk off for 10 minutes and leave the camera rolling another dimension where i just did that that's hyper time now some hyper time also goes so far as to say these dimensions last only so long as the likelihood of that decision so that dimension where i took my pants off and ran off screaming haikus, that would only last for a a few seconds because the timeline itself would be bullshit and just end. So that's what's going on in this game, where essentially um, through a a series of very unlikely circumstances, there's these people who invent essentially, who discover there's a way to cause rifts in between these quantum dimensions and in fact can find a way to pass things through. 
So, this guy, the uh, this guy named Comstock discovers how to use this for his own purposes, and basically uses it to steal a child because he starts using this to become a prophet. He starts crossing dimensions and kind of time traveling with it, and uses this knowledge to predict the future. He becomes a prophet and he gains he rises to power. However, quantum travel also apparently makes you sterile. So you can't have children. So he uses this technology to steal a child and bring it back and claim that it's his own. And because his wife knows that he's sterile, he has her killed, things go on. And the reason that Booker decides to go to Columbia is to save, it was his child, and he goes to save it. The twist being that uh, Comstock is actually Booker from a from that decision point. Basically what happens is Booker is this monstrous character who committed these atrocities at the Battle of Wounded Knee. He was this maniac. He brutalized people. He was just horrible. And so, racked with guilt, he decides to become baptized because becoming baptized washes away his sins, or at least he believes so. When he gets baptized, he becomes Comstock. So that's one dimension. Another one he refuses. He's like, like, God can't erase my sins, only I can try to redeem myself, and that's a different dimension, okay? So the one that the one that becomes Comstock becomes this zealot, he's the one who discovers quantum, you know, dimensional travel, and then he's the one who steals his own child from another dimension, okay? So that's where this all starts. That's the big twist, where he's he is Comstock. <laughs> okay, so right away, I'm not saying any I'm any kind of genius, I'm not. Sometimes, however, I can just call him, and I can call him a mile away. For instance, I did not see the ending to Bioshock coming. I, I'm not, like, this is why I say, I'm not any kind of genius at all. So, but for some reason, as soon as I saw the first any kind of hint of dimensional travel, when it opens the portal and, like, it, you see Paris or something like that, and you see a marquee for Revenge of the Jedi, and it's playing Everyone Wants to Rule the World, or Everybody Wants to Rule the World, I was like, oh, dimensional travel. Comstock is Booker. I was like, boom, right away. In fact, I think the... I called it. I just called it. And so when the big twist came around, I was like, uh-huh, yeah, saw that coming. I was, And now, that's not the fault of the game. It's so not. I'm just saying, like, some of the punch of that ending, a lot of the punch of that ending, I was like, damn it! I saw it coming, and I was like, I, I shouldn't have. Sometimes you can just call it. So... That's that's the general premise of the game, is that Booker doesn't know it, because he's kind of blocked out his own memory, because he's so racked with guilt over selling his own child. That's the thing, he, you know, when his wife dies, he gets into big gambling debt, he becomes a drunk, he becomes near suicidal, and he gets in deep with gambling debts, and so he gets this offer that his debts will be forgiven if he sells off his daughter, and so he does that. And he's, he blocks it out somehow. That, that's kind of one of those moments that I thought was kind of bullshit, was that he sells his daughter off, and then because he gets involved with this dimensional travel, he overwrites his own memory to match something. I just That seems like a fairly major thing that I don't think you could just forget. But I'm actually willing to let that one go. Because it works really well for the plot. Pardon me. Um, so that's the setup, as he's trying to rescue his own daughter from himself. <sighs> Now, this is where I found the game to be really at odds with itself in terms of the violence, okay? This game is insanely, incredibly violent. It is way too violent for the kind of story it's trying to tell. By, by a lot. It's a video game. I know that. People get killed in video games, and you have to have violence in video games like this. I agree with you. This game is insane with the amount of violence that goes on in here. I I finished Bulletstorm not a few months ago. I it, Honestly, if I were to pick up Bulletstorm, it would probably have violence on the level of, if not slightly less, than Bioshock Infinite. And I remember kicking people into beds of spikes in that game. It is ludicrous how much violence there is in this game. And I'm not prudish about violence. I was just not expecting this 
it takes the level of violence in Bioshock, blows it away. I felt so taken out of this game. It, this is such a cerebral storyline with a lot of depth and complexity. It is so immersive in terms of setting and in terms of how thoughtful the story is, about how you have to deconstruct what's going on in this plot. There's so many little things to pay attention to. And then you then you play a character who is literally taking a, a radial saw to people's faces. And not just like one time. You do this like a hundred times where you kill people with a fucking radial saw that's strapped to your wrist. It's like, it takes like this, this really intelligent movie it, it, it would have been a great movie, and they turned it into an average uh, video game. They should have made a movie about this, because then it would have been condensed, and it wouldn't have had this ridiculous amount of violence in it. So, it's just so hard for me to reconcile this really intelligent story with a guy who is tearing people's hearts out with a radial saw. Because the, the entire point of this thing is for death blows. You know, there's, there's no reason to have this except for the Sky Rail, which is very distracting and has no place in this game, and the Death Blows, which are really creative, if I grant you, but it's like mixing Mortal Kombat in with the butterfly effect. It doesn't make any sense. And it's funny, but I should not be laughing at the level of violence in this game. Honestly, I, you should almost make a hit reel of like the really quiet, somber moments where you're analyzing character and this really tragic story of this character who's done horrible things and is trying to redeem himself, and then ah, it you can't have it both ways. You just can't. You can have some violence in there. In fact, if you reduce the level of violence to a bare minimum, it actually has a lot more impact than this fucking circus of blood you've got going on here. It's amazing. It, it took me so far out of it. And so it really is, a lot of people were apparently ready to forgive that. I just found it, it, it took me so far out of this setting. It's it's gross. It's it's actually kind of disgusting. And I'm not a prude about that kind of thing, but this was nauseating, this level of violence. You want to talk like, man, I was not expecting that. And what's really funny about this, again, this is a video game thing, but... When you're talking about this kind of violence, let's say that, again, if this were real, and we're in that, we're in this, we, we can't even, we can't even begin to, but if this were real, and you were taking this gigantic, almost dull, it's not even like a radial saw, it's like a series of hooks that aren't even really all that sharp, because how could they be? You're like riding a steel rail with it. But you're, let's just call it a radial saw. You're taking this radial saw and shearing people's faces off and, like, ripping their hearts out, like, splitting the rib cage open, pulling it open and kicking them off a fucking, you know, precipice like this is Sparta. You're doing horrible things to these people. Horrible. You're setting them on fire. But the gore that happens in these games is so hilarious and so over the top. Imagine this now. Let's say you had just finished doing this. You have torn apart, not ten minutes ago, like six people with this thing. Which is not unlikely. In fact, that's, it's, it's very likely that you've just done this. So, I'm going back to that Toy Store scenario. You've got this character who's committed these horrible, gory murders, walking into a toy store with a gun, who is covered head to toe, dripping in chunky gore. Could you imagine getting out of that situation and not look like a fucking horror show? You would look like fucking Ash from Evil Dead. Only worse. In fact, that was one of those things that made Evil Dead so funny, was that he would be all covered in gore and the next shot be completely fine. It would be like that, but like, you know, the pipe burst, you're covered in gore, but you stayed that way and you're walking into a toilet. People should have run fucking screaming from you. You would look like fucking Jason Vo Jason Voorhees didn't have that level of gore caked on him. You would be so horrific and so disgusting that you would be the easiest motherfucker to find in the world. But no, you're like, you're somehow able to like be undercover in this town, walk into toy stores and like apparently you don't even, you're not even not covered in gore. You look fine. 
Because, like, even if you had, like, a nosebleed and you had, like, this level of, like, a little trickle of blood, people would comment on this. Like, you walked into the toy store, the guy like, oh, you've got some, are, are you okay? You, wow, you got, that's a lot there. No, like, you took a buzzsaw to these people and you sliced them in half. You fucking vivisected these guys from stem to stern and you, you don't have any blood on you? Really? So, yeah, I was, I, I just found that really, really funny. Where... This is so go like in Mortal Kombat, your character is dripping with blood. There's blood everywhere. Um, there's no blood pools on the ground. There's there's no blood on you. It was really funny. It, it, it's it's it, I don't know what the alternative is. I don't know I don't know how you resolve this except for taking this this stupid shit out of the game. It, it it's not even at the level of like if this were real. This is like how do you get away with this? If you even think about it for a second, it doesn't make any sense. Um, I, I don't know what the alternative is with Invincible Elizabeth. Because what do you do? The very reason they made her Invincible is so this game doesn't become a prolonged escort mission. In fact, it's kind of meta in that, like, they go, when you get Elizabeth, it brings a little text screen up like, wait, wait, we know this seems like an escort mission, and it's so not because she can't die. I was like, right on. But at the same time, it was like, it's it's kind of funny watching her run around, like, as machine gun fire is erupting around her. Like, she don't even give a fuck. Um, so, yeah, um, hang on, let me, uh, oh, another thing I didn't like was there's really not any boss fights. There's a couple boss fights, but it always seems like it's the same thing. It's like, the, the motorized, the mechanized patriots aren't really boss fights, they're just kind of the elite soldiers. The only real boss fight that I can, that I can quite remember is the handymen. And I only remember fighting like two or three of the handymen, but you never really got a chance to look at them too close, because whenever one pop, whenever there was one that popped up, you were just running away from it. You were trying to get away as fast as possible, and so yeah, I guess they count as boss fights, but you didn't really have any time to appreciate them. Um, so... If we're taking it on, if we're taking this as a video game, if we're accepting the level of ultraviolence that we're, if we're accepting that level, there really should have been some memorable bosses. There should have been some big things to fight. There should have been a guy in a fucking blimp that was like doing weird stuff that you had to, you had to like target various parts of it. You know, use your different plasmids and weapons to kind of soften it up. I've seen so many more. So many games that were so much more creative with the tools like this that they were handed that had really memorable boss fights. There's so many shooters that did this and did it so well, and it just seems like a really... It seems like several wasted opportunities to have some really clever bosses that use these plasmids, that require you to use the rails and use these plasmids. Like, probably one of the better scenes is the attack on that giant zeppelin. Although I don't know why there's so many sky rails that just kind of twist around that go nowhere and come from nowhere for no reason. It just seems like they were there as a means to board this Zeppelin. It, you know, and you start to think about it, like, why would they build these things? They don't go anywhere, you know? It just kind of twirls around in a loop like a roller coaster. Or was that the point? I don't know. There really needed to be some bosses in here. Um, the only time there's any kind of boss, uh, and the, the only boss-like encounters are just kind of marathon fights with bad guys. You're, it's just like you're barricaded in a, in a room, and there's waves of enemies keep going at you, and that's fine once, but there really needed to be... Like, how hard is it to have some kind of giant Goliath guy who is beefed up with plasmids that has, like, destructible armor and weak points to certain things? Like, a guy like the Super Scroll, who is, like, who has four different like, body types that are weak to other things or who can split up into four various elements and you have to kick his ass like that. I could think of so many ways to make this game so much more memorable and exciting. You know, bosses that you can look at and kind of appreciate and be afraid of, not just handymen who just, as soon as they see you, leap towards you at warp speed and punch you so hard your field of vision goes flying and three-quarters of your health goes down. It's a scary enemy, to be sure, but it just didn't feel like a boss. It felt like a middle finger right up your ass. Um, so, back to the plot. Here's where I really didn't like the plot. It's not that I didn't find it intelligent. It's that uh, I, I really disagreed. I, I don't like the implications of hypertime. I never liked hypertime, and I don't like this. Because 
when you take, if you buy into the, the theology or if you buy into the philosophy that every choice is played out in a parallel universe, it's clever to think about because it's, it's, it's quant, it's, it is very kind of intrinsic to the concept of quantum physics in that, you know, for every decision, every decision is made in, is perpetually, uh, not perpetually, uh, potentially made. And until that decision is made, both decisions are made. Kind of thing. It quantum physics doesn't make any sense. So, but that's kind of what's going on. Problem. When you're dealing with that, when you're dealing with that viewpoint, where every decision you make is a parallel universe, all of a sudden, y your life is meaningless. If you think about it, your life is is inconsequential. It means nothing. Why? Well, because it doesn't matter what you do. Every single, th every single choice that you possibly have is made. So you essentially have no responsibility for your decision. It's not your free will that that decision is made because it's already been made. So you may think you have made the decision, but every decision has been made. You are just in that dimension where the decision that you made has been done your way. And the person who made the other decision, he had no choice. He thinks he had a choice, but he didn't because every dimension is played out. So, basically, hypertime is the anti-life equation. You have no free will. It's an argument against free will. Your life is pointless in that you have, your life is predestined. You, the chain of events that leads from your beginning to end is specific. It goes all the way to the end. Every decision is already mapped out for you because every decision is made. I know that is hard to follow. I know that doesn't make sense, but trust me, that's what it means. Now, you could say, well, it matters. Every decision you make matters in your timeline, but does it? Because again, not only is every decision that you make played out, every decision that everyone makes is played out. So now you have an infinite number of dimensions, infinite upon infinite upon infinite, hence the title, but you have all these infinite dimensions played out with billions and trillions of people in them. So infinite times trillions, there are so many versions of you that exist making all of these decisions that you are so insignificant. This version of you in this dimension is just one of infinite geometric to the infinite power versions of you. Your life is so inconsequential that it's, it's meaningless. You know what I mean? So it doesn't matter if you made a decision that saved the world or destroyed the world because there's an infinite number of worlds who gives a fuck, you know? So uh, that's, that's kind of where I come from, how I just don't like the implications of that ending. It's clever. It's a valid interpretation, but I don't like it. So that's not to say it's a flaw in the plot. You might very well believe that. You might even just like thinking about it. I like thinking about it, but... And again, this is not a reason why the game is bad. It's not. I'm just saying why I personally did not like it. Here's where I really did not like the story. And here's where I, where I do think the game could be, is, is the plot anyway. This is why I don't think the plot is very good. And, and, and where, again, I don't know if the writers meant to do this. Because if they did, it's actually very clever. It's one of those things where I can't tell, and maybe that's the genius of it. Here's the thing. Okay, so basically, uh, Booker saves Elizabeth, and he's like, I did it, I won, you're safe. And Elizabeth goes, yeah, you saved me, but there's an infinite number of me. There's an infinite number of dimensions where you didn't. And those infinite Elizabeth suffered horribly. They died or they suffered for decades before they died, or worse, they became just like Comstock, and they they bombed New York. There's an infinite version of that where, where the, all the horrible things happen. We found the one dimension, although there's an infinite, infinite number of dimensions, but like, yeah, we won, but there's so many dimensions where we didn't win. So what do we, like, so Booker goes, well, what do we do? And she's like, well, we have to stop this before it starts. We have to go back in time to that one decision point that was made where Comstock was made. You know, we have to go, we have to go to the dimension where 
Comstock was just beginning and stop him. So this entire, this entire concept where Comstock was made never happens, none of this happens, none of this suffering occurs. So you go, okay, um, so you're like, okay, let's go kill Comstock, let's stop Comstock, let's, let's drown the motherfucker before he ever becomes who he is. And so, you know, Elizabeth goes, are you sure? And you go, yeah, I'm sure, let's, we gotta stop this, we gotta stop Comstock, because this suffering has to end. And she goes, okay. So then you go back to the moment where Booker gets baptized, and the big revelation is that this baptism is where Comstock was philosophically born. And so the infinite Elizabeths drown you. Comstock is never born because Booker dies at that point. Game over. So then we, we get to the point where th all those timelines stop at that point. And so actually where it's very clever is from a quantum physics standpoint, Booker still lives. Even though he's drowned, Booker still lives. Because it, they only drown Booker in those dimensions where he chooses to get baptized. However, it's not it the dimension where he chooses not to get baptized still exists even though by drowning Booker it shouldn't exist because <laughs> this is so funny because the choice that he makes is no longer a choice. It's predestined because all the other dimensions where he makes that choice are destroyed so the only thing yeah, you know what I mean. So that's why at the end, after the credits, you see that sequence where Booker is still alive. He's still at his desk, and he hears he hears his daughter crying, and he goes to the room, and he pushes it open, and game ends. So that's why Booker is still alive, even though even though you see him drown. Um, just trust me. He's there. There is a reason why he's still alive. I made no sense just now, but he is. Um, again, that's kind of where the genius falls in. Where if you if you try to map it out, I remember seeing uh, I remember seeing there's a bunch of like charts that map out the timelines. Very well done. Um, so it is fun to deconstruct it, and that's where the genius of this plot is. Here's my problem. We have now gone back in time. Booker is... We've gone back in time before, uh, just after Booker has made that choice. He's rejected the baptism. He will no longer become Comstock. You think we've won, right? We think, well, things have come out on top. You know, things... We, we have stopped this horrible chain of events. Everything is peachy from now on. Booker is safe. The daughter is safe everyone's happy. No, we're not. Not In fact, things are horrible now. This is almost, it, 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 well, it's not arguably worse, but we actually have, maybe, for th maybe things for Elizabeth slash Anna are worse. They might be, we don't know. But I'll tell you one thing that's guaranteed is that Booker is still, what, okay, from, again, look at it from uh, an outsider's point of view. Now that the entire choice has been, the whole choice between baptism and not baptism has been made, what has changed about Booker DeWitt? Nothing. Nothing has changed when it comes to Booker's psychology or his past or who he is or who, you know, nothing has changed from this guy. Now we're talking about Booker is still the motherfucker who committed war atrocities at the Battle of Wounded Knee he is still a psychotic monster who feels bad about what he did, but he's still a mass murderer. He is still a drunk. He is still a guy who's gambled away all his money. He still owes he still owes the mob or whoever he owes the money to. He still owes virtually all of his money to these guys. He might actually very well be killed because of these debts, because nobody nobody exists now who will buy off his debt. And he is still the exact same kind of guy who would sell his own daughter to pay off his debts. He's still that guy. Because none of that character growth that Booker experienced in the events of the game happened. None of it happened. Because those, every one of those timelines has been erased. Right? So, none of that character growth paid off. It's, it's all been undone. Booker is still a horrible person. He's still, it, given the chance, he would still sell his daughter. So, yay. So we, we spent all that time and, and we, we, accomplished, we accomplished some things, but when it comes right down to it, 
what have we sentenced Elizabeth to? We've now sentenced Elizabeth to a deadbeat, drunk, horrible person who will, who would maybe not, who maybe would not sell her given these circumstances. But he would have. He'd felt really bad about it afterwards, but he would have. He's still he's still horrible, you know. Um, and his his motivations are he's he still even the fact that he was willing to go back and save her like the whole idea that he was willing to go to Colombia um it is almost as it, it's it's ter that is terrible as well because he goes to this place he goes to Colombia to save his daughter and it, it depends on whether or not he knows whether or not he knows his daughter is beside the point but let's just say he goes out there with that plan. So he goes over there to get redemption. You know, he's committed these horrible things and he thinks by going to Columbia and rescuing her, it'll wipe away the debt. That's the, that's kind of the recurring theme of this is if he does this thing, if he does this one thing, he wipes away the debt. So he's going to redeem himself from all the horrible things he's done from all the people he's killed and tortured and brutalized all those Indians that, you know, all that racist, you know, he, he used to be a racist, he used to kill people, he did horrible things. He, he's basically hellbound. And he's going to redeem himself by going to Colombia and killing every living thing he sees. Not only killing them, but sawing their fucking faces off, setting them on fire, and having them devoured by flesh-eating fucking crows as they beg for death until you blow their fucking heads off with a shotgun. Yeah, he'd be a great dad. Do we really want to see Elizabeth go home with this guy? He's a fucking monster. Even when he's trying to redeem himself, he's a mass murderer. He's a freak. Can you see how, how horrible this idea is? You're, I'm actually rooting for him to lose. Because this guy, he, he, he's, he's reveling in this death and slaughter. I can't even believe it. You know, it, it's, it's almost, I, one wonders if she'd have been better off with Comstock. Because at least Comstock, I mean, okay, he kept her sealed in a tower, but at least she was taken care of. You know, she had basic necessities. She had food and water and stuff to read. I'm not saying it was right he had her imprisoned. But in terms of, like, safety and well-being, and, you know, just, uh, maybe she had it better. I don't know. But, like, now that, now that the whole timelines have been erased, what's she been condemned to? A deadbeat, drunk motherfucker who would have sold her into slavery? Yeah, great. We came out on top. whoop -de shit So, this is where I wonder, like, did the, did the writers mean for this? to happen are we are we meant to walk away from this seeing that ending where booker is like anna and pushes open the door are we meant to come away with that with like a rosy ending because i don't get that that's not what happens not to me so yeah i wonder if the writers meant for it to be meant for it to be that bleak you know D did they mean for it to to be like good good job you won for whatever that means so, if there's any kind of, if there's genius to this game, that's it. You know what I mean? It's the plot. I, I think the plot is by far the best part, because I can deconstruct it that way. Um, now, you're likely to say, you're likely to say, it's just a game, relax. You know, you know, Booker wins, we come out on top. Maybe there's some part of the old Booker that's in the new Booker that, that sticks through. I don't buy it. But whatever. Um, I come away with this with a really bad feeling in the pit of my stomach, the way this the way this game ends. Uh, in fact, I, one wonders if we came off worse. You know, because um, what kind of future does, is she in store for? I don't know. Um, so that's where it is. Um, the last thing I'll leave you with is I'll go back to what I said about this being a really good movie. It makes for a okay game. Oh, there's one more thing I want to talk about. Um, it, it, 
it's not a very good game because while the story is brilliant, what I liked about it most was the beginning and the end. The middle is worthless because nothing happens in the middle of the game. Okay, the best part of the game to me was the first hour where you you enter Colombia and you just take it all in. You're looking around and this this world is bright and vibrant and terrible, terrible in the sense that morally terrible. Um, but you're watching all these people. There's a parade going on. There's celebrations. There's all sorts of color. There's a, there's there's people enjoying themselves. You can go into stores and and you know really cool stuff is being sold. You're you're looking at all this this oldy timey wimey stuff going on and you know you can just you can walk around like you're wa like it's really like you're walking around a fair you know back in this time period and you just you, you, it feels wonderful and there's not a shot fired. You know, you're 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 listening to the fucking Beach Boys being sung by like a barbershop quartet, and I'm sitting there just soaking it in, going, "Wow, this is amazing." And then things, you know, even the even when it, things become like dark, and you realize that this is not as rosy as it seems. When all of a sudden you find that this place is insanely, horribly racist, where they throw fucking baseballs at black people and people who you know, fraternized with black people and anyone of different colored skin, you know, you're like, oh my God, this is terrible. When you see that ethical and moral bent take place, it's so exciting and it's so engrossing. You want to know more. And then it becomes fucking Splatterhouse. You know, and it stays Splatterhouse for like 20 hours. And it contributes nothing. You only get like very bare glimpses into the setting from that point on. You know, the, you, you only get a, the barest of glimpses into into the the intricacies behind this story like you know almost nothing about Comstock other than that he's a racist prick um, you know so much more about Andrew Ryan in the in the original Bioshock games there's actually kind of a, a dialogue between you two but not in this game nothing really happens of consequence in the middle of this game like it, it you you try to save like this Chinese arms dealer only to, like, you spend, like, ten hours going between dimensions trying to save this asshole, and he dies no matter what. So in the end of all this time, you've accomplished precisely nothing. Um, so, like, it goes from huge immersion and huge plot for an hour, nothing for, like, fifteen, and then everything ha everything is explained in, like, the last hour. It's such poor pacing. So, you know, you, it, it's it's poorly paced. That's what I mean is, you know, Bioshock does this thing where it, it evolves over time. You know more and more about Rapture, and you know more and more about the people as you listen to the data logs. You learn all this stuff about people, and at the end, everything comes full circle. Everything ties up in a bow. In this one, you could take the middle out, slap it together with only, like, you could take, like, one level where where most of the the details of the dimensional rift is explained like when you could take that scene where he goes to the tower and rescues Elizabeth and kind of just kind of cut together anything with Elizabeth where she's taken where she goes and you've got a really good movie it really is just a gory splatter fest film or uh, game that i just don't think it's it's not paced well and it really takes you out of the game where you're so involved at the beginning and then it just loses me there's so many. There's so much extra stuff that's. It's just extraneous. It's distracting. When you really want to, it's just remarkable how much this game is engrossing and awesome. And there's not a shot being fired. And that's the beginning, and that's the end. So that's why I say it's a great. It's a great movie. The last thing I want to leave you with, and I promise this is the last thing, was I was uh, on Twitter. And there were so many people, uh, Takahata, I, I talked to Takahata all the time on Skype and stuff like that. And he was talking about something called the, uh, the, the Noise Boy or something like that. I can't remember what it's called, the Noise Boy, I think, where it's like these, these freakish, almost like pyramid head style guys that are like humanoids with like these fucking speakers for heads that go in all four directions. They're really scary looking. Those are one of the better enemies, so to speak. But there's a, there's a moment in this game, apparently, where you are trying to open some gates and stuff like that, and you pull a lever, gates open, and your guy goes, oh, this gate should be open, I should be able to rescue Elizabeth right now, and you turn around, and like, right in your fucking grill is a noise boy, and it's like the biggest jump scare in the fucking game. And 
they're like, that's like the best scare. I was fucking blown away by this jump scare. You know, everyone's talking about how brilliant it was and how exciting it was and how the the noise they made when they leapt up and screamed. And I saw Takahata showed me a video, like a compilation video of all these people and their live reactions to this jump scare. And I'm watching this going like, wow, that was really funny. Here's the thing. It never happened for me. I didn't see that. It That moment in the game did not happen. I swear to you it didn't. I don't know what happened. I don't know if I did something wrong or like I don't know if it glitched or I don't know maybe if I like maybe if I I pulled the lever and I didn't turn around or I checked my map or I started playing like a a, a Vox quarter or something like that or or what or maybe I I like half turned around and the guy appeared and then he like just walked off and I didn't hear it. I don't know. Maybe it happened. I, I, I would have remembered that shit. I really would have. It didn't happen. I swear. Uh, so like, I had to watch that video. To, I, I was like, I was like, what are you talking about, dude? And he's like, the jump scare, because he he even says like the jump scare. And I go, what? There was no jump scare. I'm like, no, <laughs> I didn't get that. So I don't know. My word on the jump scare is this is again another generational gap thing, or at least kind of. Um, even if I saw that jump scare, it would have made me jump, but I would not have been like, ah! um, for, for this sole reason, I have seen that jump scare a thousand, well, not a thousand, I've seen it dozens of times. Um, that's not to say it's not a good jump scare. In fact, I'll, I'll, it is. It is a very good jump scare. Um, but I have played so many games that have had the exact same jump scare. Um, if you've ever played the Fear series, they do that so many goddamn times. I am in. I am just desensitized to it. That scare does not affect me whatsoever. In fact, this is actually, this is kind of depressing when you think about it. It has happened so many times to me in Fear that it doesn't matter what kind of game I'm playing, usually shooters, but I mean always shooters. In any shooter ever, this could be anything. Um, whenever I play a shooter and I reach that kind of checkpoint where I'm like walking into a room and I'm alone and I pull a lever or I push a button or, or whatever, if I reach the end of the hallway and pick up some kind of item, I actually expect, or I, I am mentally braced every single time for that to happen, for me to turn around and some guy to be like right here. It's not that I think it will happen. It's that I have seen it so many times and shat myself so many times for that exact jump scare. Every time I see that situation leading up, I'm like, there's going to be a guy behind me. And 99% of the time, there's not. But that 1% of the time, I'm like, oh, Jesus, yeah, saw that one. So, but, like, my reaction is not anywhere near as funny as anyone else who has not seen that scare. Again, not saying, I, that it's a good scare. It really is. But, like, if I seem blasé about that scare... And here's why it's really well done. I actually applaud this jump scare. It is really well done. It just would not have gotten me. Um, especially after Eternal Darkness. If you've ever played Eternal Darkness in your life, nothing shocks you anymore. <laughs> and if you have not... Again, youngsters, if you have not played Eternal Darkness, Sanity's Requiem, I have said this a thousand times and I'll say it a thousand more. Get that fucking game and play it right now. I'm telling you, stop this video, go pl find it. Find Eternal Darkness. God damn you play that game. If you're any kind of nerd, play that game. It is... That was like the game... It was a console seller to me. That was like... If you were going to buy a GameCube for one game... I mean, there's a lot of games for it, but for me, it was Eternal Darkness. And it'll play on a Wii. I don't, Probably not on a Wii U, but you can fucking find it and play it. I don't care what you got to do. It is the scariest game I've ever played, and it's probably one of the best written. It's amazing. I love it so much. Don't tell anyone you're playing it, because they'll spoil it. There's really not much to spoil, but just play it. Don't read it. Trust me. Trust me on this and play it. Okay. So, the reason it's a good scare is it is a jump scare. Okay? And you know how I feel about jump scares. But if you remember what I was saying about jump scares, I, this is what I said. You get one. You get one. After that, jump scares are no longer effective. You're just afraid of the loud noise. But 
Guess how many jump scares there are in Bioshock Infinite? One. It's perfect. It's well done, you don't see it coming, and it's fucking hilarious. When it's right up there, it will scare the fudge out of you. And there's one. Somebody was listening to me because it worked perfectly. So if you can actually find it, it's, re it's really a YouTube video worth watching because it's really funny. And if you, if, if you were not, if, if you haven't seen that kind of jump scare in a shooter before, yeah, you'll relate. But yeah, I'm kind of blasé about it because I've played a ton of, if there's any kind of like horror movie shooters, like if you played the newest Doom, I think it's like, yeah, Doom 3. If you played Doom 3, pff, fuck. Doom 3 is so unfair with its jump scares. Um, Fear, the entire Fear series, at some point, like halfway through the game, when you're climbing the ladder and there's a jump scare there, you're just like, oh, fuck you, you know? Like, as soon as that ladder scare, you're like, that's how it's going to be. You're like, this is how you're going to play it, right? Okay. Okay. So, from that point on, you're just kind of bracing yourself for everything. And so, like, I'm hardwired now to just... I expect it. So, there are some games that still surprise me, but it's not so much the jump scares. It's like that... It's atmospheric. I'm, I'm a much bigger fan of atmospheric scares, which is why I like Eternal Darkness. And Eternal Darkness has more than one jump scare, but they're earned, if that makes sense. And they're all, they're all jump scares of a different kind. If that doesn't make sense right now, and I, I agree, but they're, they're done so differently that they're really, really clever. So if you come up with, if you come out with nothing else other than outrage for me for bashing Bioshock Infinite, please go play Eternal Darkness. That has nothing to do with Bioshock. I'm just like, this is completely tangential. But, um, before you think I'm coming away completely denouncing this game, I'm not. I'm saying it's okay. I am not saying it's game of the year quality. I'm saying this. The, I, I the story is very well written. It's not very well developed over the course of the game, but I think it's very well written and it's very deep and immersive. And it really does pull the. It it manages to walk that tightrope, and pull off one of the harder things to do, in any kind of story. And that surprised people. And that's to do something they don't see coming. Now, I saw it coming, but I was... Again, that was just luck, kind of. You know, it was just like, for some reason, I saw that first thing with the dimensional rift, and my synapses just clicked. So, I'm not saying I'm smart, but, like, for a lot of people, almost everyone didn't see that coming. And so, like, that's... It's really hard to do after the Shyamalan era, where... It, everyone's very blasé about that, and everyone is kind of looking for the twist now. Especially because Bioshock 1 and 2 are kind of centered around a twist. That's hard to do three times in a row. You know what I mean? Um, it's the gameplay... So where I come down negatively on this game is I found the gameplay to be at best average, probably more on the mediocre side. Uh, definitely uninspired. Um, the story is something that I don't like merely because I vehemently disagree with the with the the philosophy behind it and I don't think or at least I really wonder if the writers intended for me to walk away with the kind of feeling that they wanted me to maybe so maybe not and so I guess if there's yeah I, I guess if there's any kind of genius is that I don't know you know, that's that's actually kind of the mark of a good story where I can both of us can walk away with a very different interpretation. So, um, it, it, that's my review of Bioshock Infinite. As rambling and as incoherent as it was, um, maybe that's the best part, maybe that's the best thing to come away from it, uh, come away from this game with, is uh, uncertainty. Because that's a big part of the game is uncertainty. So... Yeah, it, it's it's definitely worth playing for that reason alone, for the analysis of it. Uh, just that kind of mental analysis that it sticks with you for so long that it's worth thinking about, even if you don't really like it. That's why it's worth playing. So, have fun with that game. Uh, <laughs> I, would you kindly uh, play this game? That's all I got. Anyway, bye.